I'm Tycho, and these are fighting words. Today we're going to talk about the ideal LARP. But so, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, um, it kind of feels weird to say a fantasy LARP because that, like a fantasy fantasy LARP, <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, it gets more like the dream LARP. We're going to try and keep it plausible, though. Um, we're going to try and, and talk about things that are in the realm of can actually run because... So no it's actual easy. castles, no actual siege towers, no actual elephants. Yeah, uh, no, no, you know, no cast of thousands. We're not talking about, you know, not even something as modest as a blockbuster LARP, um, you know, where you pay to basically main character in a movie for a weekend. Um, and they have people who are hired to be there um, to NPC for you. Um, but not even that. We're talking about standard a standard accessible to most folks game. Um, we could talk about this in terms of battle game or in terms of a campaign LARP. Well, I think uh, in terms of battle game, we kind of already have as close as we're currently capable of getting with uh, the contention of lead circle, at least as far yeah. as, as, as you and I are concerned of what we look for in a game. Um, I would, yeah. I would say the contention of leads is a, probably the, uh, the current pinnacle for a battle game. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, the lead circle model, or the um, the victory at at the the victory model, because I actually prefer the victory model to the lead circle model. Uh, specifically, the first victory, I think, with a little bit of tweaking, um, we could have made that. We could have made that something really special. Um, it was special. It was good. Um, um, it's still a successful game, but. I think I'd need I'd need about two or three more years of play test to really dial it in. Um which we would have had, but fucking corona. Um, <laughs> um The age of the coof has disrupted our quality control procedures. But yeah, um so what these are is basically Milsim paintball, to be honest with you. Yep. <laughs> um <laughs> we didn't we didn't have anything new. We did we just we just stole a bunch of ideas from uh, Milsim, Paintball, and Airsoft. But they're games played on a large field. Um, I think the EMR, upper, the EMR upper field is 10 acres. So I think that's close to a square kilometer. Um, it is substantial. And the fact is it's heavily, it's, a, you know, it's an eastern temperate forest. So it's very, very overgrown. You're talking about the um, one past the, the town, right? Past the town, yeah. Okay. Where we did, uh, where we did the last two victories. Yep. Yeah. And so it's an eastern temperate forest um, in the spring and fall, so it is overgrown as heck, and um, that adds to the scale because you can't see real. There's no, there's no sight lines beyond like thirty feet. Which is no, maybe not thirty feet, like mm, sixty feet, I'd say. Right, and that's one of the things that I think um, I personally like being a factor is that. Sight lines, runners, scouts, and logistics actually become a factor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It adds so much more dimension um, to a standard battle game experience. And so many more loadouts become viable. Um, especially light infantry loadouts. Um, light infantry goes from, you know, arrow catchers and skirmishers to a vital part of the battle plan. Yeah, because when your battlefield is that place that George didn't mow for the past month, well, you can see everything. Uh, you're not really going over long distances for to get to your engagement zones. You're spawning, marching, <clears throat> what, 30 yards? Yeah. And then you're just having it out there. But when your march might be, you know, a couple hundred yards and you don't want to show up at the wrong place, well, that adds a, another dimension to the game, and it's one that I I really appreciate. Oh no, it's it's very exciting as a commander um, to try and figure out and out guess um, movements of an enemy that you can't you can't actually have line of sight on. Um, and that's I mean I like victory just because victory is bigger than um, than Jess's field. The field that we do a lead circle on is a very nice park, but it's it's small. 
Um, yeah, and there are limited um, lines of engagement there. So, like, if you see a, a party moving in a certain direction, you can guess with near certainty where you'll be able to engage them because there's only so many ways to get from one point to another there. Um, yeah. Yeah, versus EMR is just that the scale is just so much bigger. Um, and there's so many avenues to move through that property. Um, and only some of the, only some of them have ground hornets. On, only a few. <laughs> All of them have gopher holes, though. It's much your stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just like I, I appreciate it because the things you do have persistence, um, and it has meaning beyond. Well, we ran up there. We ran up their kill counter, so their res turned off soon, or. You know, and granted, it's the same objective because it's, you know, or, you know, take and hold a point. Um, that's the same whether it's an open field or a, a game like this. But, like, especially because, you know, these kinds of games work, like Victory and Leeds, they work because you, you throw enough objectives that it's almost impossible to do everything. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, holding specific points, holding specific objectives, um, it adds more meaning and it, it, you know, it creates really memorable moments. So um, we do also have NPCs at both of these games. I think the NPCs at victory turned out a bit better than the ones at Leeds, just because the ones we, we used at Leeds were kind of an alpha run. Uh, and there were a few issues that came up with how they were deployed and where they ended up, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> The Leeds NPCs worked for Leeds. They wouldn't have worked with Victory. Right. Um, and part of it is making sure you have the right NPCs. Um, and part of the other issue with Leeds was we were losing NPCs because the NPCs didn't didn't practice self-care and ran themselves into the dirt in the first in two hours, two hours into a six hour scenario. Um, that happens. Um, but um, in at Lead Circle, the big difference is Lead Circle had combat NPCs that were there to actually engage in combat. Um, I'm pretty sure Victory only had support NPCs. I believe that's correct. I think the goblins kind of made themselves pseudo NPCs at, at a point, um, and they could be like hired to come. I don't know. I didn't deal with them a lot. It was it was complicated. Um. Uh, but there, but there was it, a lot I'm of weird sure stuff. It was only support for NPCs, just because because I didn't get any complaints. To be honest with you, right. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's combat NPCs, someone will always complain about them because somehow somehow there will be about a dozen people who miss the. There are NPCs. They will take more hits than you do. They are not cheating. They are just playing. Keep hitting them until they drop. I promise they will drop. People will ignore that shit and be like, "Who?" Dan took five hits before he went down. I mean, like, it's because Dan had five hit points because Dan was playing an ogre. Um, <laughs> well, didn't we have that demon at victory as a combat NPC? Did we? It, you know what we did? We did, but no one complained about him. No. So. Because he was real noticeable. And I think everybody knew going in. I think we might have, we might have had it. I think we might have sashed them. Like, we think we might have given him sashes, the NPC, if we had combat NPCs. Yeah, there weren't there weren't a lot. They there were mostly like support and quest givers. Yeah. Um yes, actually you're right. They were supporting quest givers. Um and I think that just works out better. Um but also Victory had 120 people on the field versus the 60 something at the last leads. So that changes the dynamics a lot too. Um, right. It's not only a matter of the scale of the field, it's the scale of how many fighters are involved. Yeah, and, and you like for these simulationist events to work, you really need you need fifty per side at least, or else it's just too sparse on the ground. Um you know, you, you should you should have a sense that you are always in a conflict zone, even if you are currently unseen. Like it should not the intensity of the combat of the conflict should not drop to the point where you feel completely secure. 
Um, assuming you're in the conflict area, not like behind the lines. Like, but so yeah, if, I think if if Sorry, you've been ahead. to Victory or Leeds, then you you have a pretty good idea of of what we consider. That that's basically the skeleton of our perfect battle game, and yeah. there's improvements we'd like to make to it over time. Uh, we just need to run them again and figure out what needs doing. Yeah, and I mean it's the you know it's the shame of it's not even a shame it's just a a fact of running big events. Um, there is a limit to how many you can run in a year. Um, ben and I found that out the hard way. Uh, <laughs> um, running three weekend long events on this scale a year almost like it completely burnt out uh myself and uh long dog um so you know you just can't run them that often um and the other thing is um oh excuse me so yeah you can't run them that often and that makes play testing and refinement a slow process um if I find something is broken about a scenario, I will not have an opportunity to test a solution until the next year. Um, so you, there's a lot of guesswork involved in planning, but yeah, I think, you know, or work, we have scenarios that are at a B plus level that have the potential to move to an S tier level. So that that's where we stand as far as battle games. So for, for an ideal, how do we want to categorize would you say an ideal campaign LARP or an ideal LARP in general? How, how do we want to narrow this I, down? I would say, I would probably say campaign LARP. Okay. Cause th that would be my preference as well. I'm not really into the idea of a one shot or a one off LARP. Um, I mean, like, yeah, yeah. I just, I just would, I just wouldn't invest enough in it. Yeah. Like, the the only, the coolest one that one off things are are, are deeds of arms really mm -hmm. and that's a that's their own category um but yeah no i'd say campaign games now when we say campaign we don't necessarily mean that it needs to be a 20 year long game with no resets uh exile i think does a reset every what year and a half or so every two years about um and damn i think it might stretch to two and a half years sometimes but every two years yeah and damarung is four seasons set seasons <laughs> yeah three seasons left yep i don't know what form malleus is going to take but that's a little bit more like team fortress anyways uh, i i think malleus is not uh, is not going to have a, a limit right um i feel like dead legends should have a limit um but i don't think it does so let um, me dive into that real quick I don't think Dead Legends has a limit. I think it should. I agree with you. And the reason why I think it's okay for Malleus to not have a limit is that character progression is pretty soft. To, well, it's pretty well capped. Not a hard cap, I don't think. But there's a there's a pretty strict limit to what you can do. And you can develop a character further. You can explore the concept more. But you're not going to end up like some of the uh, the Nero clones out there where you're like, aha, yes, now that I played for six years and paid the bonus fee at every single event, I have 800 hit points and I can point at you and everything in a 10 meter radius around you takes 300 fire. No, that's, that's well, well, dumb. Malleus, Malleus, you can literally has a, has a, you can literally get two advances and that's it. Yeah. So, that's that's so, it. That's a hard cap, two advances. Well, I and think there's also even... a bit of a soft cap in, in the whole upkeep and gear thing. I think yeah. that that's a bit squishier, but yeah, two advances and and that's it. That's that's your character. Um, <laughs> um but actually, um, so I overall think games need either a hard cap on. Well, um, do we want to talk about like capping seasons or ending games, like finite games? So i I want to start at the root. Okay. The reason why both of those concepts are important, um, in my estimation, is that what you need is a limit, like a band, I guess, of how strong characters can be. And the reason I think that's important is that when you send out encounters, you have to calibrate them. And if the difference between a first-time player and a five-year veteran is three hit points, that's easy. But if the difference between a first-time player and a five-year vet 
is 694 hit points, there is no way on earth that you're going to send out a meaningful encounter. You cannot do it. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I, I, I share your opinion on that. I think my philosophy is always in the Lord of the Rings movies and the books. Not one member of the fellowship could ever afford to ignore an orc. Right. Like, and, and I, I forgot that this is, we are doing these audio because I made a really interesting, I really, if, if you, if you've ever met me in person, you know, the expression I just made, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I forgot I can't use nonverbal communication right now. Um, <laughs> it was an expression of, this is really fucking obvious. Um, I, I but, yeah. know the exact expression. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Aragorn never ignored Nork. Um, a, a threat to a human-sized character should be a threat to every human-sized character. Um, it should not be something that could be safely ignored. And there are a lot of games where that is 100% the case. And I know there are people who like to play those games for certain reasons, but this is about our preferences. Um, so... I prefer not to be in those games because I think that's an, 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 it is a game breaking absurdity to me. Um, As an example from personal experience of that sort of thing, I went to a unnamed Nero clone. Well, it has a name. I'm not naming it to an <laughs> unnamed Nero clone out in Jersey somewhere. And uh, I, I was on my NPC shift. So the character that I was playing that weekend had way more hit points than an ordinary starting character because of the armor that I wore. It was my leather jerkin, which they considered to be Mastercraft leather armor. I would never consider it such because it's not armor. It's just a fancy dress item. But they said, oh, it's made of leather and it looks nice. You get an extra 32 hit points. This... <laughs> not obviously couch. <laughs> yeah. It's like, ah, you, you didn't skin the, uh, the leftovers by the curb. So uh, clearly this is masterwork quality gear. And that took my hit point total from eight to 40. If I wasn't wearing that jerkin, I would have had eight hit points that weekend. It would have been trash. It was still pretty trash. But so you got to think a starting character without the benefit of master wear gear has a, roughly eight hit points, you know, plus or minus six, I guess. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in that band is what a starting character is going to have. I was a martial character. So eight is. I, I guess I would say eight is in the upper end. So probably between six and 10 is what, what you should expect. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was given my NPC shift, I was given the alpha wolf card. I was an alpha wolf and the friend who I went with and uh, was a lesser wolf that had 40. So right there, like a, a puny lesser wolf had five times as many hit points as I would have without my vest. I had 60. When I went out into the game world and I attacked a few people, the first person we attacked, we we did properly wolf pack him. I, I howled to uh, kind of set him on edge. And then my my partner ran out ahead. He focused on them. I ran up from behind and started hitting him. And he just kind of pretended I wasn't there because he could do that because he had 400 hit points. And the 10 I was swinging for was not in any way anything like a concern for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like... Just being a part of those encounters just completely rips me out of any any immersion that I've ever had in the game. Like, I could still have fun with them just because you know it's pretend and booping, but like, I'm not invested in it anymore. Like, it's just like, oh, this is this is ridiculous. Um, I actually have a, a different reason that I I prefer uh, limited uh, um, limited games where it's. <clears throat> where it's limited to a few seasons or a limited run or they reset um you run out of good plot yeah look at look at how ridiculous shows like supernatural and buffy get <laughs> like you could only threaten to destroy the world so many times that's not um, true you can threaten to destroy the world as many times as you want don't listen to Erdak. he's trying to limit you well, you do like the Star Wars Extended Universe, so that's why you have that <laughs> fucking opinion. <laughs> this is the Death Galaxy. It is totally not the last, not another version of the Death Star. This one's a triangle, not a sphere. 
actually most of my favorite EU books are just about starfighters, so <laughs> <laughs> the super weapons hardly enter into the equation. <laughs> but yes, you um, do run out of plot. I can see that being an issue. It's not one that, that entered into my calculation just because I tend to look at things from more of a balance and player agency perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, but since a campaign LARP should have a, a pretty solid plot element to it, I can definitely see that that being a factor to weigh when you're making your designs. Uh, uh, plot matters to me. Like I, and I, I, out of the two of us, I get way more into plot than you do. Yes. Um, but it, like it matters to me and it matters to me that it tells a cohesive, a cohesive story um, and that it's not a fundamentally preposterous story. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons I said, I hope dead legends is limited because I don't want to see dead legends turn into a fucking cartoon. There is that risk. Um, like, there's just a limit of how much stuff people can throw out there. The other thing Dead Legends kind of screwed itself on, no, this is a very long-term long-term concern, um, because they tied in-game years to actual years. Uh, eventually, you're going to get, like, I think it's set in the 18, not 18, like late 1880s. Like, eventually, you're going to get to the turn of the century, and then what the fuck do you do? Like, I'm eventually going to be able to bring a toggle action semi-automatic pistol. (laughs) And no one will be able to argue with me. (laughs) I mean, granted, it could be a really, really fun idea to do a game that runs like that and just do a hard reset every decade. With the right site, I would love to do a... uh an alternate world war one trench stormers campaign that would be but that just goes back to you and i want to do kill houses in medieval gear so (laughs) (laughs) but like like i'm saying like like that would work for a game like every decade you you do a hard reset and everyone makes new characters and you know the plot kind of holds over but like you just kind of wipe the slate clean um you know, it's, I don't know anyone who's running LARPs for four decades, but we're talking fantasy games. That could be, that could be a lot of fun, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, eventually, you know, a, a game runs out of good ideas and then you had to start throwing bullshit out there. I think players can run out of good ideas too. Um, and sometimes you're going to reach a point where you're just playing a parody of yourself. Uh, I can't think of any like concrete examples that I would that I would put it put a name to, but uh, it's definitely a phenomenon I, I've seen. Well, well, people sometimes people end up uh, like typing themselves as character actors, and they just become more and more of a parody of a. Uh... There's a name for it. Flanderization. Is it is it Flanders? I thought it was Flanderization. I think it's Flanderization. Oh. But, you know, the, just the idea is like, you know, it starts out, oh, you say the catchphrase once in a while. And then you have to say the catchphrase every other time. And then eventually you're saying the catchphrase at least once a once a game. And then eventually you're just saying it all the fucking time. And that's all you do. Um, it's like the Borg in Star Trek. When we were first introduced to them, they're scavengers. Like to become one requires extensive augmentive surgery. Uh, they they have like weird secretive goals, and then when we see them in first contact, they're space vampires. They're vampires <laughs> that they bite you in the neck and you turn into one. <laughs> it just get it gets into that rut and it gets hammered down. And they did the same thing with Klingons back when Klingons were like in the original series. They were basically Cold War Russians. They they were multifaceted. They were sneaky. They were conniving. They did all sorts of you know underhanded you know, political intrigue. And then we see them in TNG and they're space Vikings. They're, they're Vikings from space and they raid your ports and they burn your sheep. Um, (laughs) But yeah, Yeah, people can get into that rut in, in games that go on too long playing the same character. Yeah. um, And, you know, I gotta say, like, I like, with my character from Tamarang with the Rook, I, I like having a planned plot arc for him. 
Damarang is also interesting because you can't take conse- permanent. You don't take permanent car- character consequences. You don't consent to. So, like, it's possible for me to say I know when this character will be allowed to die. Like, I know when I'm going to take those safety wheels off, um, even if I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Um, but it is within but, your control to decide when that when that happens. When the window opens, yeah, when the vulnerability yeah. is activated. And frankly, if I did feel like it, I could and en- I could engineer a death scene for myself. I might. Um, you know, it's again, it's my choice. Um, you know, I get creative control over that, and I appreciate that. I li- I like that because uh, it really lets it does let me tell a story and not just play a game, uh, and that that matters to me. Um, that actually, def- oh, go ahead. But having a defined arc really helps me with that. So you mentioned that having that choice is important, and that touches on something that I mentioned earlier, where player agency is is one of the big things that I look at when I'm deciding on the quality of a game. So in a lot of these Nero clone LARPs, the ones where the campaign goes on for years and you can buy extra XP and people with high level builds are just bonkers, like beyond even level 40 D and D stuff in those games, a first level character can't do a thing. They're so helpless, so weak. I I played in one where I could not even finish off a downed enemy more than I think two or three times every six hours. After that, I forgot how knives work. They, they made, they commodified every single basic function of a character. Anything that you might want to do in the game had a hard limit that was impossible to overcome as an early level character. You see, I, this is one of the reasons I love rules light. And I love the rule that, like, it's not that you can't do it. You just suck at it. So, like, at least that gives you a dramatic opportunity to be terrible at stuff. Like, and that's fun. Um, But, like, you know, no rules like game is going to dictate if you can finish people off or not. Yeah. Well, and that was one of the things I really liked about Exile was I found out early on that you can always finish someone off. You can just also get better at it. So, it yeah. You can do just about anything, but you can make yourself better at certain things if you. <clears throat> yeah, is, uh, that. You know, sorry, go ahead. Which isn't to say that every character can do everything, but I mean, if you pick an ability, and that uh, Exile is one of the games where I went in as a first time character and was able to contribute meaningfully to the successful outcome of the game. Like there was a plot for the weekend and through either skill with a stick or abilities the character had. And in some games, it's just the stick. Like I don't have any abilities and they, I won't for, unless I play the game for another year and a half. So this was one of the games where not only my ability with a stick, but also my character's abilities actually came into play. Yeah. I mean, since we're talking about what our fantasy games are, my my preference is always the more WYSIWYG it is, the better. The more what you see is what you get. Can you do it? I love, with, with that question, I love when the answer is, I don't know, can you? Yep. Um, <laughs> that's my favorite kind of game. Like, can I climb can that I... tree? I don't know. Can you? Yeah, like... They didn't know you were going to start climbing the tree. Yeah, well... <laughs> um... They they have not but, heard the motto of your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's important to me. Um, it just, I hate, I hate game. I, I can't, I, you know, this is supposed to be positive. So let's try and be positive for once. <laughs> I love games where there is a presumed level of character competence. Like where my character, even on their first day, is presumed to have put their pants on all by themselves. And fed themselves breakfast. <laughs> and there are some games where that is that is not the case. Like, <laughs> like they expect you to take points in literally everything. Um, <laughs> that's so I like presumed competence on the part of characters. But um, 
Congratulations. But you can use a knife for free, but literally anything <laughs> other than a eating utensil is going to require several points of investment into the holding things skill. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a real thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so back to, you know, ideal ideal games. Uh, I think we both appreciate games that encourage player agency. Um, you know, I like, I like limited campaigns because I like dynamic plot. I like interesting plot. Um, so like even in dead legends, like I know, I know Ed is, Ed, Ed Marsh is a finite character. Like I have a couple exits that are possible for Ed, but, uh, but I'm not going to play him forever. Um, but that's a personal choice. And the other nice thing about Dead Legends is it has a pretty low skill ceiling. Like the prestige classes are kind of are kind of nice, but fundamentally, like three NPCs with guns will still kick the shit out of you. Guns are the great equalizer. <laughs> God made men. Sam Colt made them equal. Um, but yeah, so you know. That's that really is the saving grace of Dead Legends. The reason that game works is guns are so fucking ridiculous. Like, you know, just the the fact that generic NPC whoever can can realistically down nearly every character in four shots, and three is would work ninety eight percent of the time. I think if if they have a crappy gun, uh my character would be left standing after four, but only just. I'm thinking a five damage gun, which is like average. Oh, five damage gun. Yeah, that's going to three shot me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know. <laughs> and that's so like, that's not a that's not a, a rare enemy to have a, a it's something that's shooting for five damage. Um and I don't know of too many player characters who would be standing after 15 points of damage, not without calls. Oh, no, that's what I mean with calls. I'm saying the four is with calls. Okay, four with calls. So like, actually, like I'll, when I when I redo my build, I should be able to survive four with a call. So calls are something I want to touch on. I'm not as opposed to them so much from what I've seen so far in Dead Legends, just because bullets move fast ish i mean nerf darts move fast ish and so the kind of cinematic like dodging that people may expect out of an action scene isn't as possible it can be done i've definitely dodged bullets in dead legends but uh it's having a call for yeah i take cover because i can't realistically get there fast enough i'm i'm a bit more forgiving of that what i really don't like is when systems adopt a verbal parry system as a means to try and equalize skill because that's not actually what it does. Yeah. Um, well, I think they work in Dead Legends because nerf combat has a high degree of randomness. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the nice thing about nerf combat. You can only get so good at it. Like, you could be the operatingist operator, whoever operated. Um the foam, the little foam dart is still gonna is still gonna miss because the like the strike cone on these things is terrible. Like, <laughs> you know, it's still a shitty piece of foam that probably got bent in half in your bag, so it's it's not gonna fly straight. Bullet spread, very yes. <laughs> the rivals are fucking mean though. <laughs> Rival balls are kind of scary, dude. I'll, I'll have to experiment with them. When I ever get around to playing a character who handles firearms, uh, I'll let you play with the Saturn I got. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the the verb <laughs> the verbal parry system. I've I've seen some games put it in as a way to be like, not everyone is good at swinging a stick, so we've added this to the rules so that people who aren't as good at swinging a stick can still manage to have fun in combat. But if you think about it. I'll 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 run an example. I, I fought at one of these games and for every time the guy hit me, I was landing five or six shots on him. Now it was an NPC with probably 180 hit points. So I wasn't really making progress. I only swung for one. Two, one, 
doesn't matter. It was going to take me a long time to chew through that pile of hit points. And I think he was swinging for like 10 or 15. So he really only had to hit me three or four times, and I had to hit him at least 90 times. But I was making progress. So the fact that I was hitting him five or six times for each time he hit me. All right, let's add a parry into the mix. Now you think, oh, well, that'll equalize it. That'll make it so that he has a bit more of a chance, but it doesn't. Because if I get the same parry, now for every time I hit, he hits me, I'm getting nine hits on him. It's going to skew the numbers because everyone has access to that same verbal parry. So, so I've actually been thinking about this, and I think we have two, we're seeing this through too much of a battle game perspective's eyes. Um, because fundamentally it doesn't matter. Because most of the time, you're not going to have PCs competing against PCs. Most of the time. Um, in most campaign games, that's a fairly rare occurrence. Um, so the fact that you know, you're making life a little bit easier for the people who are already very skilled, like, it doesn't matter that much. The idea like, being that the, the verbal parry is coming into play against NPCs, so PCs are getting a quality of life buff that they're not necessarily going to encounter a, like, a, too many NPCs using parry? Is, is that the idea? Well, like, it doesn't matter if the NPC has parry. The NPC's stats are the NPC's stats. Right. Like, you know, it's either a hard NPC or an easy NPC. Like, you know, no one's going to get salty about an NPC's stats uh, unless the, the game runner is doing a real terrible job and, you know, throwing out monsters that just wreck house and are completely unbalanced. But, like, I'm saying, you know, everyone's getting a, like you said, a quality of life boost that they're applying to NPCs, not each other. And this is, again, predicated on the game, not having a big PV, PV, PVP element. If you decide anything important through a tournament and you're adding these things, you're not balancing the tournament. You're, any, you're just giving an edge to people who are already good. I suppose it makes sense if there's not any PvP in the game. I was thinking of it mostly as uh, as an overall, like, everyone in the game. I wasn't thinking in my head separately between NPCs and PCs, but I can I can see how that could make sense. The other issue, I think, is that most of the times when I've seen that kind of system, um, it's in one of those 900 hit point games where things are wildly skewed out of out of any semblance of reason anyways uh that's probably colored my perception of the of the vocal parry i mean they do compound compound problems i i don't i don't love them as an element but like i see where it comes from like and the idea that it is an equalizer what it, it's not saying it's equal it's going to equalize two players in a duel like i i think there is an understanding that you know you're never going to get a you know someone who's purely there to rp to be a, a real challenge to someone who's an equivalent level who's a dedicated stick jock like i don't think that's the goal i think the goal is to make the person who's dedicated to rp able to be an effective combat presence versus npcs so you know they could feel like they're contributing to holding the line you know they're contributing to the fight in a martial capacity um, instead of just being dead weight or useless or a target or whatever. And, you know, they might not be as good at it as someone who actually trains the fight, but they could still manage it to a degree. And I think that's the equality that people are looking for with that. Like that's the level of accessibility to the physical classes. That makes more sense than how I usually see it justified. Yeah, I, I just I I've, I've just been thinking about it recently, because like I know this is a this has been a, a set off point for you and I both, and I'm like, well, because here's the thing, like, okay, so just to to back it up a little bit, um, so in Damarung, uh, I'll just be honest, um, I got I got uh, roasted a little bit in the forums because of an opinion I have about metal armor uh, and armor generally, which is that 
I prefer to award people who go through the pain in the ass of wearing authentic gear. So if you're wearing steel, you should probably get a little bit of bump of a bump for that over someone who's wearing plastic or aluminum or you know HPDE or foam, foam or whatever. Yeah. Because like it's a pain in the ass. Like steel is steel is heavy and you know degrades you as a fighter a little bit and it's just irritating. Like it's going out of your way and it the thing is to me it looks better. Like some of the foam is getting close but I I I'd still prefer a, a well-made coat of mail or a well-made coat of plate over any fake armor that I've seen. Um, but it, but uh, the idea is this is ableist because people might want to play warrior characters who have, you know, some sort of physical problem where wearing 23 pounds of a mail is not a viable thing for them, but wearing you know, a plastic lamellar that weighs four or five pounds is just as viable. Um, and it just didn't sit right for me in Damrung because Damrung is so PvP driven. Um, versus a game where it's PvE driven, I don't give a shit. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, because Damrung is PvP driven, it's it it kind of struck a chord with me as something that I think it just strikes me as unfair. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> it's, well, it's kind it's of funny. irrational. Yeah, because I have seen other games where they where they are more campaign focused, more NPC driven, and I've never really cared about their shitty armor standards. Um, because there are games out there with shitty armor standards, and so long as it's like I'm gonna go kill some goblins and then hang out in the tavern until the undead attack it, like they do every Saturday. Whatever, wear a couch, like. It, it doesn't really matter to me. You you look terrible. I don't care. Um, but because Damrong, like you said, is there's a lot of PvP involved, that kind of tweaks it. Yeah. Well, and and the other thing is with the with the first set of rules, it mattered a lot. Uh, heavy armor effectively doubled your HP. Yeah. Um. So you know you being able to claim literally a hundred percent additional HP dramatically increased your survivability as a character um so it mattered a lot i think in the new season i'm going to care less because like i could work around the rules like i don't throw glancing shots <laughs> like it, like that's really <laughs> what it comes down to I, I don't throw glancing shots heavy armor allows you to ignore a glancing shot good i'm not giving you any <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um so the the new set of rules, instead of simply adding more hit points, they they are allowing you to call off glancing or grazing hits, depending on the type of weapon and the type of armor you're wearing. Um, but if you <laughs> modern problems require modern solutions, my friend. <laughs> um, if you don't throw glancing shots, they can't blow off your shots. <laughs> um. So yeah, I think I'm going to care a lot less because it matters a lot less. Um, but yeah. Um, so, so go ahead. We, we we talked about calls and armor a bunch. Since we're trying to, to narrow down what we would consider an, an ideal campaign LARP, yeah, I think so far I would say there needs to be like a narrow band for character progression possibly either through the mechanics or through a actual chronological limit. Like you can only, this, this arc will only last so long and then you make a new one. Um, um, it's, it's interesting as hell that Dan is doing the 25 year between the season time skip. Like that's a great way to, that's a great way to limit characters. You get to play your character for three seasons and then they're fucking old. Yep. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> considering the setting, t t one season and they're pretty old. Two seasons, they're definitely old. Yeah, yeah. You, you and I um, are playing weird elemental, you know, woodland slash forge creatures. So, you know, two or three is less elderly. But I'm I'm sure by the last campaign, Volkov and uh, Daruk are going to be. 
going about with uh, tennis ball walkers and uh, <laughs> shouting at the Kerns and the Nordvics to get off their lawn, which we already do, of course. Just we chase them now. In the future, we're going to have to get the whippersnappers to chase the whippersnappers. We're just going to have to get crossbows. Well. You're just going to have to get crossbows and rocking chairs. Modern problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. um you know something that something that puts a, a ceiling on on the sheet progression you can go through um is always i think beneficial to both of us i personally prefer the characters themselves to be time limited just to keep the the plot and the story fresh yeah and i mean i'm i'm actually good with with either or both because the other thing that i like the idea of that i've always been interested in but I haven't found a game that lets me do much of yet is the ability to explore different character concepts without dumping, like without losing an investment in the character that not, not that's insurmountable, but like <laughs> if, if after a few months I decided that I didn't want to play the Rittmeister anymore, um, I would have spent, you know, several, several months and, you know, a few hundred dollars devoted to building this character and now i'm starting from close to square one with another um and because there's so much opportunity for advancement in the game like you can get your character so high uh and the way characters scale it's harder to accept that restart whereas in a rules light like more limited game like if if I decided that Volkov was a silly concept now, it would cost me nothing whatsoever to start a new one. Yeah, that's that's one of the bold things that Damarung does that I approve of. Um, they just say, vary your options. These are your three options. Pick one. It doesn't matter which one. Um... And even within that limited nice framework, feel. both both in Damrung and in Malleus, there's a lot of room for interesting character builds within that limited framework. Oh, and yeah. You, and if you decide you wanted to try a different one, you wouldn't lose out much by, by starting over. Whereas in Dead Legends, if I were to start over, yeah, I would be losing out on a bunch. Like, we've, we've poured in-game resources in, into gear. We've poured in-game resources. All of that would disappear if I decided to come in as a Boston Whaler. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, and it, it really does help keep things fresh, I think, to have games that don't punish trying new shit. Um, that's actually, I really don't like the fact when games put a, a penalty on permadeath. Like, <clears throat> like, no, you should encourage people to end their character's story. Um, that's what should happen. Like if in these stories, most LARPs like the like the tell and we're talking about we're talking about fantasy action LARPs, um, you know, where there might be elements of drama, but there's also a shit ton of fighting. Um, you know, I'm sure games that are purely driven by drama might work differently. But like in a game like Dead Legends, like Lazarus Gap, should, well, Lazarus Gap's fucking weird. Um, <laughs> you know, Lazarus Gap has full that explains why the mortality doesn't stick but um you know in most fantasy games where you are regularly getting into sword fights there should be a high level of mortality like and it doesn't have to be you know i i i'm not saying i would expect people to die to random orc um but like i think there should be a limb a, a willingness to tell those stories that you could only tell if a character dies and it sticks because it's not a heroic sacrifice. If your buddies bring you back a half an hour later. The, the other thing about limiting characters that, that I think is important is that when you have characters that go on for a very, very, very long time, you, you tend to get these um, sort of like interdependencies where this person will get a plot dedicated to them and them and their friends like it so then they get some more plot dedicated to them and those characters remain and nothing like they they don't die because death is is rare and 
it just keeps compounding until eventually it's it's that main character syndrome that we've discussed in other episodes because something good happens to you and your friends you talk glowingly about it in the after action reports and in the reviews well so now you've you've motivated the staff to continue to provide you and and your circle with you know the majority of their focus and and those long running characters can kind of become a like a social vacuum oh yeah you're you're a hundred percent right but you know again we're talking about ideal ideal games so something so our ideal game would limit character growth and have some sort of of chronological reset i i, I really fucking love what damarang does with this <laughs> i think that's the cleverest shit like um, just so so everyone knows, um, it's it's gone to a very very it's gone from a kind of rules light to, system to a very very rules light system where there's like twenty things, maybe like maybe fifteen fifteen to twenty things, and they're things like wear heavy armor, use a crossbow, use a gun, know how to heal people, know how to read and write, um, like know how to harvest. A certain type of resource but they're they're very broad categories um and you just pick three and if you're young you pick three and you have one hardship when hardship is just a role play like oh you've been through this shit you have to role play this somehow if you're older you pick four and a hardship if you're really old you pick four and two hardships but it doesn't matter which one you pick and there's no progression. So it's just nice and simple and flat. Like the difference between like a starting character and a middle character is so minor. Um, that it's just like, yeah, you just switch whenever, you know, make alts, who cares? And that's, yeah. I, that's one thing I love. You could just, just make alts. <laughs> like you want to be crown lender for a day, make an alt. Um, that that kind of flexibility and ability to to do alts and to do rerolls and to kind of ex- explore different concepts, that that would be part of of my my ideal LARP. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's just, it's just it's very liberating and it's like it makes it way lower stakes when you just decide. You know what? This is a good place to end this character's story. Like there might be scenario there might be scenarios where I'm like no. This is not the planned ending I had for Daruk, but this is the ending I'm going to take because this is cool as shit. Like, I like this plot. I'm happy to end my story here. Um, and I'm able to do that just on the merits of do I want to stop playing this character versus have I invested two years and several hundred dollars of my time and money into this character? And now I have to start at the beginning. Um, so I think that's that's big. Um what about plot? Like, what do we? What's what's your ideals in terms of plot and just series and tone of the game? I suppose. So I think tone is more important than plot because I kind of don't pay an awful lot of attention to plot unless it's bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. This is very true. <laughs> like, as long as the plot's good, I, you know, I'm there for it. I am as involved as I need to be to continue having fun with the game, but I don't like go nuts for it or seek it out or and i i never request plot i've never gone to to a game runner been like so i had this idea that i want to have happen to my character because that's just not super important to me but when a plot's bad that drags everything down because then i actively don't want to participate in it and the whole point of me being here is to participate in this shit so if if you've undermined the gameplay experience by having a plot that's so bad that i don't even want to swing stick that's the problem so um, if, if if you could do this without getting us banned from anything we want to go to in the future, <laughs> can you give us some general outlines of what bad plot looks like to you? Okay, so the number one hallmark is the bad plot is incomprehensible to anyone who hasn't been reading the back page of the comic book. I, I will agree on that. I, I will agree on that. This is, and this is tied into having games with resets. Games that just run on for 15 years get utterly incomprehensible. Like, it, if I've only read New 52, I understand all of the current DC canon. But if I want to understand all of DC canon, I would need a master's degree and an encyclopedia. 
Your yeah, game so should not be like the entirety of DC's back catalog going back to the 1930s. I was going to say, it's like, it's like the X-Men. Like, who the fuck knows anymore? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who's in the X-Men? All, all of them. Everyone's yes. an X-Man. Yes. Um, they're just different Deadpools now. <laughs> There's a bunch of different Deadpools. Deadpool with different hand puppets behind a behind a black sheet. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so that that's one thing of... is 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 if it's incomprehensible to the casual player, um, anyone should be able to show up day one, and either through through tropes or through like freely available published information on on your. Like it should be part of the background notes or something. Like when I build a character from a certain area, if I show up and there's a plot about that area and it doesn't reference any of the stuff I read on your site, or it's, there was one game where there was a barbarian tribe. And if you read the stuff on the website, you're like, aha, Vikings, shamans, like we're going to, you know, eat some mushrooms or something and then (laughs) bite our shields and go plunder the English or something. You show up. And oh wait, that guy looks like a bad extra from Last of the Mohicans. Uh that guy has like a turtle on his head. That man over there is literally wearing the headdress from the Flintstones with the horns. And oh my goodness, their chief has a shag carpet as his vest because that's his idea of fur. And they're supposed to be First Nations. <laughs> not oh Vikings, they're First Nations now. That's not what it said on the website. Oh boy. Wow. I forgot about that story. <laughs> that, that was a bad one. Um, another thing about bad plot is bad plot focuses around not concepts or events, but individual characters. And that's not always, oh, that, that's not that, always a hallmark of bad plot. That, but it, that, it is that gets me though. That gets me though. If your plot involves a certain player character, that 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 kind of sets me against it and i'm pretty i'm 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 more open than you are about following along because this is the thing that we're doing today um but if i find out that the thing we're doing today specifically has to do with one person i'm i I am immediately losing interest like if if we've gone out in the woods at the head of a war band and all of a sudden an npc steps from behind a tree points to one of the PCs and the PC says, yes, I understand now. My time has come. I'm going to turn around and go back to my cabin. <laughs> and you know, I've done it. I have done yes. this at games. Yes. Uh, I can confirm. I will go um, home and read a book instead of follow you around through the woods while we discuss how awesome you are. Cause that, that shit sucks. Um, <laughs> Um, and it's not even necessarily a PC. It can be about an NPC that I just don't give a shit about. But if it's about a PC, I absolutely do not give a shit about it. So, so it can happen with NPCs and it could be okay because everyone gets roped in because of the way they do it. Yes. Um, and that's, that's fun. And that's, that's something that works. Um, yes, you can sometimes get a, a DM PC or a pet NPC that you don't give a shit about, but that's way less rare than this person asked for a specific plot and the rest of you got dragged along and no one bothered to tell you that if you weren't friends with this person, you should have just stayed in the fucking cabin. Um, like that, yeah, so that that's that's irritating as hell. Um, <clears throat> I, I will say, going back to plot comprehensibility, um, it's honestly, it's one of the it's probably one of my least favorite Dammerung experience or not Dammerung, excuse me, dead legends experiences. Um, the werewolf thing. Yeah. So that goes back to tonality too. So like, um, I'll let like you finish, all, but yeah. Yeah. And, in, in all the, uh, in all the dead legends, the website and the website and all that, and all the source material, it goes on about your character is effectively a person living in the regular world. Cause Everywhere but the Black Hills is pretty much regular in the Deadwood universe. Um, So your character ought to be skeptical or as skeptical as your average person in the 1880s should be towards anything supernatural. 
and um, they go they go out of their way on the newbie adventure to really reinforce this. I will say, like their newbie adventures are really good. Like I have always loved playing an NPC involved with the newbie adventure. It's just a hoot. And I remember um, when we went on the newbie adventure, we played that skepticism all the way to the hilt. Oh, oh my gosh, we did, yeah. And it's fun. Like it really is fun to like you as a player know what's going on, but your character doesn't. And you're like, hee, 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 when will I find out? And, like it's fun. Um, like I think for the first hour, I referred to all the werewolves as wolves that had run through the laundry. <laughs> um, and it wasn't even the first night because the first night it was just like, okay, this we we encountered someone who made references to I hope I didn't kill a bunch of people. Um, and that was kind of just like that was still that was still matching the tone because this was just like we just had an encounter with a crazy person um who might or might not be a murderer um okay weird but nothing supernatural the second night um there's just like three to four pieces who had become werewolves running around the town and the reaction of the townsfolk was that this was an entirely ordinary expected and socially acceptable thing for it to happen. Um, and that was really jarring and really kind of unpleasant. Yeah. So that gets to the tone thing where the, the tone of this, it, it's supposed to be a, a fairly realistic sort of game. And like you said, we're supposed to be skeptical of all the weirdness. Um, but when people start to, like, when, when their characters act blasé about it, it's really weird and off-putting. Like, I, I kept having to fight the same werewolf over and over again because they kept getting up, chasing people. I would knock them down. After 60 seconds, they would get up and chase people. And everyone just kind of wandering around town, you know, just going about their, their business. I'm like, there's a wolf here that no matter how hard I hit it, keeps jumping back up and trying to eat people. Does anyone see a problem with this? Like, oh, that's just me, Moss. I hate you all. <laughs> and the, the thing is, they should have pumped up the werewolves. What do you mean, pumped them up? Like, like made like them a, more dangerous? Like, made them more dangerous. Like, they don't even react. Like, they don't even react to. If it was me, I would say they don't even react to uh, to non-silvered weapons. Or if they react, it's just you are slightly staggered. Like, you don't actually drop from the damage. I don't think because there would be a town left if they did that. that well, that's exactly, the, that's exactly the point. You make them you make them a problem. Or make it very limited. Like, maybe a few things can knock them out. Like Maybe so fire, are, too. Fire, the, fire is the, accessible. Yeah, fire, fire will drive them off. Um... Yeah, I like I like that. Fire would drive fire drives them off and can put damage on them if you can hit them with it. And then but you need silvered weapons to do damage. Um that then well, I mean they're that's the rail drivers. That's the that's like fast rail drivers. Which is something they should do because it's scary as shit. <laughs> <laughs> like that's terrifying. Like and then you can't become blase. You could become blase because like That most of the people who 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 become uncontrollable werewolves are not melee combat monsters, so they're not actually a threat. Yeah, like you could just kite them. Like if you're if you're a decent if you were a decent fighter with a thirty six inch weapon, you could kite. And like, and just because you could do that, everyone metagamed it as to this is not really a problem. Or, you know, you could just also pour nerf damage into them. Because even if they only take one damage per shot, fuck it. You know, mag dumping is not that not that long in ner with nerf guns, you know. And there's usually several people to one werewolf. Yeah, so. Like, but just at becoming blasé uh, on the part of the players. And... Well, to expand on that, the town's attitude towards several of the entities. I mean, especially um, Puppy Feet. But I mean, oh, yeah. th there's others as well. That's just uh, the one that I've been around for the most, where you and I kind of have this innate aversion to puppy feet because, you know, he's terrible. 
But we see him and we start to warn people like, oh, puppy feet's been lurking around. He's creeping around by the edge of the woods. So don't don't leave town alone. Don't, yeah. don't overextend. And then people say, oh, well, let's go see how our good friend puppy feet is. Hello, puppy feet. How are you doing today? <laughs> let's let's go that, that was the worst that was the worst moment ever oh <laughs> let's go see what he wants how about no because whatever he wants we shouldn't give it to him <laughs> if he wants it it is a thing he should not have <laughs> yeah if he desires it he needs to that is that is all the reason to keep it away from him uh, <laughs> I, uh i don't i so as far as tone because because that does connect directly to this I'm pretty flexible on tone as long as it's consistent and stuff like that and stuff like, Oh, well these inhuman monsters who tend to eat us, they're not so bad. I think we should try to understand them. No, you shouldn't stop. (laughs) This isn't Twitter. You're not going to score points by being the most understanding person in the room. You're playing in a game where you face the prospect of death. You're meant to face the prospect of death, and you should do so in a consistent bi- in a consistent fashion. Not even that. Like almost every one of these games has has at least some aspect of this enemy is irredeemably and by its very nature evil. Full stop. Like not even a question. Like not like they're misunderstood. This you know this this particular species you know is fighting for you know its survival slash its territory slash whatever like no just they're evil because they are because evil exists and and they are among that category i was gonna say evil exists as a literal categorical presence in this universe and they are allied to it for whatever reason like let's stop the water wash over this. <laughs> like, yeah. like, no, let's, let's not like, uh, I, you know, it's like crying over SS officers. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Like, you oh know, man, I beat Wolfenstein time to rethink my life. <laughs> you know? Oh, I just killed an NKVD, uh, an NKVD agent. What a monster I am. <laughs> No, you're not. <laughs> like like no. You're you're categorically not. Like it's really more like, man, I just beat Wolfenstein. I think I'd like some eggs. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> Like I'm going to have a victory cigarette now. Um but yeah, it's it's that there needs to be tonal consistency. And I I say I'm flexible on tone cuz like I don't even mind when there's like goofy moments in games. Like uh Exile has some like the love bug plot that they do sometimes where someone dressed up as a as a ladybug runs around and sings love songs to people when they hear them they they have to keep repeating them because they're stuck in their head and it's like this curse yeah that's funny that that's cool do stuff like that or like uh when they did the the Jotun wedding that was hilarious that was great probably wasn't totally consistent with the rest of Damarong but I didn't really mind because um it was, like it it was, was a one... sidebar yeah, it was one moment in the weekend. It was during a slow point anyway where everyone was half out of character. Yeah. Like, it was in the middle of dinner time. Like, it was okay. And dinner time at Damarung in the in the dim halls is silly hours. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's real life shitposting hours. Um, because you need that um, sometimes. Like, yeah. I, I, I think I'm a little bit more sensitive to tone than you are. Um, because I, I can't with the silly shit. Like, if goofiness gets too... If, like, goofy or wacky gets too common, I just... I I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, I'm not... I'm not really trying to be, like... I'm not really trying... I'm, that's not really my thing. So, like, the love bug, the love bug plot, like, mm, not my thing. I mean, like I made I sure I wasn't people. around for it, but it didn't bother me that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, avoiding tonal whiplash is is important. Um, I do tend to like a serious toned game. I like, um, I don't know. I like the I like the faux gravity of shitty period dramas and like Game of Thrones and The Witcher. <laughs> 
<laughs> where you pretend to be really serious about fundamentally preposterous situations. Oh, I think um, we both like that, but I'm not going to pretend that we don't actively shit post in those same settings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't really. We we don't. Um you know, I, I might have a broader definition of shit post because I consider the whole time we spent in the castle during that burning, I consider that and from the moment they opened the gates, I was in full on shit post mode the entire time I was inside those walls. That that <laughs> whole event was a shit post. <laughs> oh no, I, I don't consider that shit posting. Shit posting is when I throw uh, rubber prop, r- rubber plot hands at people, or rubber prop hands at people. That's shit posting. Shit posting is when I throw a sausage at other players. <laughs> it mostly shit posts is me throwing things, I guess. <laughs> I, yeah. See, um, that's what I mean. I have a broader definition of shit posting than you do. I can shit post without throwing things. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I did a little shit posting in the castle, but like. Or maybe I'm just confusing guess... shit posting with me having some semblance of a character. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you are. I think that I think part of I think Volkov is kind of a walking shit post sometimes. Because when we were inside that wall, like talking to the archer, I was shit posting when I was making shit, fun you of shit the post. You shit post during like the faction meetings on Friday nights. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> 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 that's just okay so that's just volkov's character volkov is just a shit poster well i mean the first time they kind of softballed it to me like all right uh who are you and why are you here and the first three people were like i'm here to be a saturday morning cartoon villain and get beat up by the humans and then they get to me uh, uh, hi i'm Tycho. i'm playing volkov and i came here to hurt people i don't know why these three are here but <laughs> we're we're the monster faction not not cobra <laughs> Yeah, it was it was fucking great because you you pretty much <laughs> you pretty much went in to meet the scout. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I actually did quote. <laughs> yeah, I think you I think you. <laughs> um. <laughs> but I I guess so. I I like a serious tone, but I don't mind an occasional departure from it as long as. So, like, when when we do our kind of, like, semi-humorous, like, shit-posty stuff, like, it, it, whether or not we both agree that it's shit-posting, like, the stuff that we did in the castle where I was, like, making fun of the guards for being bad at their job, um, demanding to know who was in charge so I could make fun of him, uh, <laughs> telling the archer he was bad at his job because there were people hitting his gate and he hadn't shot them yet. Like, that was all kind of outrageous, and, and I, I thought it was pretty, like, I, I was kind of playing it up for comedic effect. But I was still taking the setting seriously. And I don't know if there's a good way to articulate, like, even when I'm being outlandish like that and, and you know, do, doing what I would consider shit posting, I'm still taking the setting seriously. Well, well, the, well the, the thing was, it was, and I mean, we kind of play our Yotanar a little differently than a lot of other people do, but I think we both kind of follow traditional fairy rules where if we give our word on something that's it like that's a and we had given our word that we weren't gonna draw our weapons first in this castle so we were there we were still our characters who have nothing but contempt for humans um but we're also kind of in this this extraordinary situ- situation where our first reaction, which is pull their guts out, is off the table. But that doesn't mean we have to be nice. <laughs> it, like there was no contingent to like be respectful or no, you know, be anything other than quote unquote good guests by a very strict set of parameters. <laughs> um, so like. I think us just picking a person and fucking with them is entirely in mood and entirely in character. Cause like by the end of that, we had almost sold that guy that you in our civilization was superior and that he should go live with the crawling. <laughs> well, and, and like, too, like we had him, we had him considering it. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too, was that, like you say, we, we do play our Jotun by, by very fey rules. And I, kind of play with the expectation that 
everyone around me is operating under the same parameters. Realistically, I know they're not, but that's just the way I, I play it. So I was freely mocking and agitating the guards and, and other soldiers inside the castle because I had promised not to fight them. And they had, in their turn, promised not to fight me. So I was just going to mock them the whole time I was in there, tell them that, you know, they were doing their job wrong. They weren't guarding the gate properly. These archer, he, you should have shot those people by now. They're hitting your gate. Shoot them. What are you doing? So, yeah, I, that that aspect that we're, we're playing by an internally consistent set of rules, even when we're shitposting, it's, yeah, that's probably a, a decent way to to sum up what I was trying to articulate. That. And, and it's like, like you're still, you're like, you haven't broken character. You haven't messed with any of the expectations of the universe. Right. Like, even in the Yotanar meetings, when you're ship, then I'm, I'm not even talking about the intro sessions. I'm talking about the actual in-character meetings. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and you ship post through those, too. I like, <laughs> fucking hear you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it doesn't break character that, you know, you as portraying my subordinate are mostly ignored as long as you're kind of quiet because everyone's looking for my reaction, not, not my cronies reactions. Um, so like it's, it's nothing has broken character, you know, nothing has broken the mood of the setting. Nothing has broken the feeling. So, yeah, I, I think so I far I've only directly person. delivered mockery to the, uh, the king troll when he's directly asked me a question like when when or when he's asked the two of us join it like so what happened and i'll tell him something and usually in a like less than respectful tone <laughs> <laughs> yes can confirm um but like it's still in character like yeah i don't think i've ever done anything even in my shit posting that would give cause for someone to feel like they're getting their head jerked around. Yeah. Uh, no, you haven't. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the the standard that I expect tone to be held to is that it can it can be mobile. Um, and there's a broad spectrum that I have no issue with, you know, participating in. But if you're bouncing around like a Mari Povich lie detector needle, then no, <laughs> I'm getting off this ride. And I will say, um, I, I do like I do like extended workshops. Um, I like extended workshops before game on, uh, just because they really give you a chance to communally set that tone. Um, and I think that's what worked for Dam. That's why Damrung is very consistent, and that's why Malleus is so consistent because they both have you know, fairly comprehensive workshops to establish, okay, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. This is, you know, this is the tone for the weekend. Um, versus most games that have a set of announcements and then you just dump you in uh, and kind of let you pick it up as you go along. But like, I appreciate the workshops and like, okay, this is the tone. Um, you know, again, going back to Damarung, the like, the separating into a spectrum of how close of how much you believe about Damarung and how willing you are to work with other factions, like just s observing what the player base is looking like, um, is just really helpful to setting expectations and just to kind of see who falls where. Um, I just think that that matters and that helps the setting work and stay consistent. I think those workshops definitely have a use. Um, I also make a concerted effort to have to pee in the bushes when they're going on because I hate them. Um, I've also just never really been big on like, all right, time for the staff meeting. We're going to start with an icebreaker. It's like, oh, let me go find an extension cord to throw over a rafter. <laughs> I, I don't love them either. I, I don't love icebreakers. I don't love the small talk, but I, I do think they're helpful in setting tone. Yeah. Um, and like, you know... <laughs> And especially like the fighting part, the combat part of it is almost useless. Um, in fact, it's entirely useless. Let me let me just be blunt here. Um, it's useless, and you're you like there's no reason not to go pee while that's happening. Yeah, unless you're unless you're obligated to sit through it on, as a as a um, <laughs> unless you're obligated to do it so you can play. <laughs> it's like a cultural lead or something. 
Yeah, or like, you know, it's your first game, so you got to sit through it. Uh, if you can avoid it, at least for me, I, I'm, I'm going to skip it. Like, I know how to fight safely. Like, just someone bop me and tell me this is how hard I need to hit and I'll be fine. But like, like I said, the, the plot stuff and it's like, you know, it sets Dameron apart, which is very serious business and very like, we're going to tell these somber, dramatic stories that might be heroic, but it's going to be fundamentally kind of like a serious, somber thing. Uh, and Malleus feels like Pulp Fiction um, in the Renaissance with rat monsters. <laughs> like, like, no, oh, this is going to be. This is going to be snark and ultra violence. Now that you've said that, you know there's going to be some point where you open a treasure chest and uh or I open a treasure chest and you say, "Micheletto, are we happy?" And I go, "Yeah, man. We happy." <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I count one niche. shot. I count two crossbows. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's the nature of the game. Um, and as long as that's consistent, that's nice. That's, you know, I I, I appreciate a, a semi-serious tone, at least. Um, I, I don't want to play a slapstick. Like, I don't want to no. play a slapstick game. Like, it could be serious action movie-ish. It could be serious, you know, heist film-ish. It could be serious, like, drama-ish. Like, I love drama i love sad boy stories um i really fucking do um like it's you know i love having conflicted characters um (laughs) i I got thrown a curveball on my first game of damarung um and rewrote the character concept on the fly in response to in-universe things but i'm really fucking happy that i did because oh my god the second ver the the revised version is so much better than the original one um but yeah um consistent mood is you're right on that consistent mood is really good uh is really important that's so you know um, so let's let's kind of recap so consistent mood character limits um either or uh, mechanically and chronologically. Uh, what else do we have? Rules light. Rules light. That that um, kind of goes in with the mechanical character limitations. Yeah, but I want to be specific. So rule of rules light game. Yep. Um, <clears throat> um, I personally like a game that is that has a a limited span, or at least has hard resets between seasons. That is a that is a hard pref a strong preference for me. I'm not sure you feel the same way, Tycho. No, I do. Um, like okay. like I said, that that's in a game with with that kind of it helps prevent char- certain characters from becoming that that social vacuum that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, when- I mean, if you if you retire the characters and keep the game running, that's pretty forgivable. Yeah. Uh, but I do, pre- I do prefer games that have hard resets or limited spans. I just think it's, I just think you have to, you have to start, start from scratch every once in a while to keep things fresh. Mm-hmm. Um, for combat, I'm a bit softer on verbal parries than I was when I started, but it does depend on the setting of the game. The more PVP the game is, the stricter I'm inclined to be on things like weapons, armor, and how you can avoid damage. Well, I mean, the thing is with rules light, it doesn't matter because it's right. just there's, not. There's not much of any of that. Yeah, it's not much of any of that. The you know the combat mechanics are: can this character use a two-handed weapon? Can this character carry a shield? Um, you know, can this character access heavy armor? And you know what? I could go along with those being easy to access specialist skills, especially when the HP floor is like two. Yeah, um, that's fine. I I do prefer uh, combat that is that is intentionally theatrical. Um, like I want it to be competitive, but I don't want tapping. Like I want it yeah. to actually look like you have to swing the weapons. I don't mind that, or excuse me, I want that. And uh, <clears throat> and at least for me, I prefer um, I prefer a system where armor. Armor uh, basically 
armor requires a better quality of hit for it to be breached rather than adding hp yeah like i like my armor i like armor rules where the armor um you know gets to shrug off marginal shots it's it, that you need it makes more sense that way i think having having the armor require more of a hit rather than more hits yeah well, it just feels better it just like it feels better it changes the fight dynamic because now you you know you really benefit from using good shots like good body mechanics like even if you're not you know even if you're being gentle and not blasting somebody like just getting a square hit with good body mechanics is easier since we're on combat a, a small aside i'd like to make is that i like that in both damarung and dead legends even though grappling is not a normal part of combat there is kind of a mutually consensual cutoff switch where you can kind of go beyond that if if you like um i haven't grappled anyone per se dead legends but i have asked people like prior to a combat opening up like are, are you okay with physical role play and if they say yes then once someone puts their hand on a pistol butt i can dash across put a hand on their arm and put a knife to them um and i've done that a couple of times and it's it's really cool it's cinematic uh i haven't hurt anyone because you know i've i've done this before and then in damrung i know both of us have had fights that involved grappling that were really cool because everyone involved was like yeah no that seems like a good thing to do right now yeah yeah no that's that's important is let the game be open to that because that is fun um that is really fun um and uh, you know it's happened to me in malleus too um has that happened in dead legends I don't think it's happened in Dead Legends. I can't imagine when it would have, considering the way you're normally fighting. Um, it it's only happened with me because I fight exclusively with melee weapons. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, but yeah, no, that as long as being able to jump up the intensity of the combat, whether it's of the strikes or of the contact with people who consent to that, that's. If a game banned that, I would look very sideways at that game. Yeah, well, and that that's the thing. I like that there's the cutoff switch, because if it was all grapple all the time, I wouldn't mind, but I know it would drive away a lot of the target audience. And yeah. um, it isn't even so much that I wouldn't mind if it was all grapple all the time. Like, sure, I wouldn't mind, but I think for this sort of game i would prefer it be mostly non-grapple unless you and your partner both turn that switch um because it removing it from a consideration in normal combat allows me to be more theatrical well like it, well part of it is <sighs> grappling grappling can be an equalizer if you suck it if you suck at using a sword um, and you don't want to give people who are probably not trained in grappling an incentive to initiate grapples all the time. Um, yeah. And the thing versus uh, in a battle game, because battle games are so lethal, like, okay, go ahead and try and initiate a grapple on me. I'm just going to kill you on your way in. And, you know, if you don't take the shots, I have a different problem, but I can deal with that too. Um, versus most of these games it's possible to tank a lot of shots or at least enough shots to close the gap and it's just i would not be comfortable with a general general grappling is allowed game um that's not a battle game yeah but you're right it does it it would also limit the how theatrical you're able to be you know how much you're willing to wind up your shots um, yeah, there, there's because, things I'm not going to do if I suspect that the person opposite me might try to jump on me in the middle of performing whatever whatever I'm doing. Yeah, especially if there's an expectation that I don't respond at 100%. Oh, well, yeah, and that that's a big part of why I prefer it to not be all grapple all the time because there's there's always that cuz you and I have gone into some of these games basically looking like thugs and there's always that concern in the back of my head like someone who does not know what they're doing is going to jump me and i'm going to think we're playing and they're not going to like what happens and then it's all going to be on my head 
Yep. Yep. So like as fun as grappling is, it's I, I love I like I'd prefer it as an optional. As as seasoning. I yeah. I'm not gonna huh. get too deep into magic systems other than they're okay. Um spackets are all right, I guess. I like I, I like the theatrical not. part of Damarung, the way they do magic way better than spackets. Spackets are just kind of spackets are better than point and yell, I think. Because I've I've encountered both, and spackets at least require you to hit something. You know what? I I don't like magic. That's a shitty bow. Um, I understand why games use spackets. I I, I see their place. Um, I I I don't like them fundamentally. I rather I would rather point and shout as long as point and shout is limited, which it almost never is. Uh, but I would rather point and shout and the Damarong where magic has a distinct role from being a damage dealing thing. Um, that's nice. Like I like it because it really, it really makes the wizards feel special. They're not just an archer in robes. So yeah. Um, at the risk of going over the precipice into a magic system, the reason why it works in Damarung, I think, is because the point and shout isn't just you and the red hat take 500 fire damage and everyone within weapons reach of you. Because if it was, I wouldn't like it. Well, they, I was, that's what I'm saying. It's not just like it, it actually I don't think they oh, no, they I don't think they can deal direct damage. They cannot. Um, um, I think there might be one touch spell that I can do that maybe does damage i don't know uh maybe freeze is supposed to do one damage or something like that but anyway um for the most part they if they can do damage with magic it's dramatically inefficient uh let me put it put it let's leave it at that yeah uh it is vastly suboptimal but like the point in shout works because the point in shout is just an rp effect and it's um, a lot more involved than just pointing and shouting yeah, uh, and you know, it, it the rules are explicit that the more show, the more go. Right. Which is why we load carry up with smoke bombs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the best things we've ever done. <laughs> um, that was like, fun to watch from the wall. That was a good call. Like but it makes it feel special because now your 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 spellcasters are more of a more utility utility players like Yes, there's fear, you know, and that's your base effect, a fear effect. But how you use that fear effect, um, just you get really creative with it. So you could use it, use it as an escape, like care, like we did with Carrie. Um, and it was just, you know, hold everyone off while she pops smoke, so we can all go. Or you know, you could use it like the, like the uh, Kurdish did, and clear a path with it. Um, as long as you keep up the RP. But, you know, it never felt broken, but it also always felt useful. Yeah. Um, I will say if, I will say if you want a more swords and sorcery setting, that right at the moment, I don't know what I would want a system like that to look like. I, 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 I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I just, I don't think it can be done well. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Unless you're willing to let people shoot fireworks at each other. Which, if it's a fantasy game for me, I guess I'm setting it in Poland or Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I have no problem with people shooting Roman candles at each other. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think I can get away with that in the United States. So yeah, like if, if sure, if you're shooting Roman candles and flash paper at each other, yeah, let's let's go with the damage. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so our ideal LARP would involve pyrotechnics, and <laughs> if there got to be, if there has to be wizards, let's have fun with it. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> if I have to put up with that, let's make it fun. So the the last thing I want to bring up, um, how do we feel about NPCs? Oh, 
I mean, I'm I'm kind of open on it. Like, it it's it's a tricky one because we've we've played in games with and without. I I mean, I, I like them both. Is honestly, honestly, it's not that tricky. I just I don't have a strong preference either way. Um, yeah. If it is a strictly PvP game, a la Damarung, um I think having that consent mechanic for permanent character consequences is important. Um, Otherwise, it's real easy to wind up with a failure spiral where one group's gatherers got ganked, and now that group is at a setback, and then they're going to lose their next fight and lose people, and eventually, you know, we're one week into the campaign, and the Crownlanders don't exist anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the thing. It If this is the universe, and this is the mechanic, and you have more people, the only strategy that makes sense is genocide. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not genocide. I, 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 I misspoke. Uh, I shouldn't have used that word. But wiping out, wiping out other factions, like... TPK. Yeah. Um... Like just, there is no downside to just cleaning house. Um, right. You know, if the Nordvik could have just wiped out everybody else, why wouldn't they? Like in character or meta, like, or at least make force the other factions into subordination. Um, so you know, you need that for for PvP. Um, or you do it like Malleus and you set up a safe zone. So like the town in Malleus is a safe zone. So the game can be PVP without, with while minimizing the risk of one faction just getting wiped. Um, so on, on the NPC side of things, some people don't like it. I'm pretty okay with one mandatory NPC shift during your, your weekend. Um, I think that, that frees up the staff a bit because I've been to games where that's not required and they have an NPC team of like five or six people and a town of 30 some odd and you're real limited in the kind of threat you can present with those kind of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to have NPCs being a, a realistic threat, you need to, you need to have, you need to have NPC shifts. Um, I, I don't mind them. Um, I think they're reasonable. Um, I usually have fun on my NPC shifts. Yeah, like, like it's it's a nice break. Um, I I do prefer games where they let you they let you they're they're generous about letting you NPC with your friends. Um, that that really helps. Um, I mean, not from a designing a dream game standpoint, but from a game we choose to attend standpoint. Yeah, that's kind of mandatory. <laughs> If you're going to tell yeah. me when I have to NPC and you're not going to let me pick the people I NPC with, I'm going to be way less enthused about having to do it. Yeah. Um, and like, as long as they're run smart, I don't mind it. Like I, I, I like the way dead legends run it runs NPC shift. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we are playing sentient human characters. They should not just be suicidal, you know, walking sacks of xp and loot like <laughs> you know they should have options other than encounter the players and die um honestly and like like having to do job duty as npcs is that's always kind of nah, like i don't i don't like it i don't like it as a player i don't like it as an npc like don't give me something that's there for me to just roll over it like make me work, make me be wary of it. Like that's, I appreciate that, you know? Um, but I, overall, I don't, I have no, I have no real issue with NPC shifts. Like, sure. It's fun. So we're okay with or without NPCs, but if there are NPCs, there should be shifts. Um, we prefer that the magic not be swords and sorcery because without an Eastern European sensibility towards personal safety, there's really no way to do that well. And uh, yeah, combat should be intentional, require decent hits. Grappling is mutually agreed. 
Um, not not the default. Um, limited I'm campaign pretty... arcs, limited character progression, rules light. I think we've uh, we've summed up just about every aspect I can. Yeah, that's that's what we'd like for we'd like from Alar. Good garb. Good garb. Yeah. I I want elitist garb standards. Not really elitist, but like what. Uh, if if you don't have people mad about your garb standards, you don't have good garb standards. I'm gonna lay it out there like that. Like, if you haven't pissed off somebody, your garb standards aren't high enough because there are there are people who are just real real ridiculous about what they think they should be allowed to wear uh, to game, and and those no. people are wrong, and you should make them <laughs> angry. <laughs> They're wrong. They're wrong. If they don't come to your games, it's a net positive. <laughs> Um, maybe Europeans won't dunk on your game. That's a lie. <laughs> they're they're going to do that, it anyway. That's a, that's a lie. They're going to do it anyway, but, but you'll know that they're just being salty instead of having them having a point. <laughs> Can you imagine having a lop and not having actual armored wagons? These pitiful <laughs> Americans. <laughs> don't ask no. me what accent that was. I don't even know. <laughs> Poor Americans, they can't even. Uh, not even gonna try the accent. <laughs> it's too late. That came out as a. That came out as a complete mi- mismatch. Can you believe the Americans LARP without actual stone castles from the 1100s? <laughs> that's <laughs> such where, that's barbarity. Where go- that's where I was going with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like we said in the beginning. We we don't consider castles a prerequisite to a quality LARP because we just don't have that many. And we're not Swedish where you can get grants by the grants from the government to run LARPs. <laughs> <laughs> like we're not we're not Nordic countries where we get paid to do this shit. <laughs> like mm. <laughs> So I think that comes up that's that sums it up pretty good. It does. I think it does. So our background today was uh, once again from Lunatic Picks. We've we've used uh, one of his before. Um, to this day, the best embedded reporter I've ever had at a LARP. Uh, ten out of ten would go to the sandbox again. And so that wraps up our ideal LARP. We've played some that are close. Maybe we'll find one someday. Maybe we'll get stuck running it ourselves someday, and then we'll hate it. No, we won't. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> Those you're, days are done. You're right. No, you're right. No more projects. <laughs> we, we, we have enough. All right. I'm Tycho, and these have been Fighting Words. <laughs>